Hey, fifth grade, hello there, and welcome back to Studio 37. Again, I'm continuing my series on classical art movements. Now I'm gonna talk about my favorite classical art movement, that would be the Baroque art movement. Again, I have a song brought to you by the lovely Miss Murray that goes, Baroque followed Renaissance, 1600s were the time. Caravaggio's shocking paintings were realistic and sublime. Let's not forget near Rembrandt, master shadow and light, with his brush in motion, Baroque was at its height. Another favorite sculptor of mine, an architect, was named Bernini. He is remarkable. Um, things that you're going to notice as we look at Baroque artwork is its intensity. A lot of the scenes in Baroque artwork are rather tragic or violent or scary, even though these are Bible stories. Again, just like in the Renaissance, the church is using artists to convey the stories of the gospel, and broke times that chose to depict some rather dark stories, like the beheading of John the Baptist, for instance. But please, uh, please pay attention, and I hope you enjoy the artwork of Rembrandt, Caravaggio, Bernini, Titian, Rubens, as much as I do. Thank you for staying tuned, and I'm going to turn it over to my computer now. Okay guys, welcome back. This is Mr. Shear, and we're going to start talking about Baroque art. Now Baroque, much similar to the Renaissance, follows in the same major themes. If you remember, they are uh, religious narratives, Greek and Roman allegory, or portraits of influential people. You'll see that they, the theme there stays the same, but the way they approach this theme becomes entirely different. Baroque paintings are much darker. The lighting they use, they call tenebros, where these paintings look like they're lit by a candle, and that's it. Baroque paintings are, tend to be very dynamic, where in the Renaissance paintings, there was a lot of stability and a lot of parallel lines. In Baroque art, it's very dynamic with lots of uh, curves and diagonals moving throughout the pieces. Also, Baroque paintings, they pick very intense moments to depict, very, at times very violent, very gory, very bloody, ways to tell the story of the Bible. Again, many of these paintings were used to educate people on the love of God and the mission of the church. So, and, and many of these people couldn't read, so a lot of times they would pick very, very attention-grabbing moments to make people aware of uh, religious history. So with that, we're going to dive right in. I'm going to start by talking about Rembrandt. He's a very talented artist. He's a Dutch painter. You can see on the... Far left, that is a self-portrait he did as a young man. And then in the center, there is a portrait he did as he was much older. And then on the far right, I have a painting. There's a painting called The Night Watch, which was actually a commission uh, done by a group of people. However, he tried to make it into more of a narrative painting. And it's very interesting. And the angel glowing has always been a mystery to me, and I'm not sure there are any solid answers. The next artist we're going to look at is Wana my favorite ever. His name is Michelangelo Caravaggio. He's known mostly as Caravaggio. And again, I told you guys, Baroque times, they often depict rather violent or gory or sick um, subject matter. On the left, you see David with the head of Goliath in his hand. Of course, Goliath's head, although severed, is still gasping for breath. And on the right, you see Dionysus or Bacchus. Dionysus is the god of wine in Greek and Roman tradition. And of course, he is born every spring and he dies every fall, just like the vines, uh, just like the grapes on the vine. So this would be a depiction of Dionysus in the fall. Both the head of Goliath and Dionysus are self-portraits of Caravaggio. One he did while in the hospital and getting better. And then um, one he did in an atonement for a, a murder he committed. This one is The Calling of St. Matthew. This is one of my favorite works by Caravaggio. You see Jesus as uh, shown on the far right, pointing his finger out at Matthew, who's counting his tax collector money on the table in some low-lit tavern. And Of course, Caravaggio often got in trouble for um, using... Um, 
regular everyday people in regular everyday clothing to portray and tell the story of the, the gospel. I love the dynamic lighting and the way the light falls right on uh, Matthew's face and Jesus' hand and, and the halo just barely there noticing. But it's a very exciting and riveting painting that is masterfully done by arguably one of the greatest oil painters there ever was. This again is another painting of Jesus, and this is the Downing of St. Thomas. Again, very Baroque, right? Very intense moment. Here's the resurrected Christ, but rather than floating away in glory with angels and stars like you would have saw, seen in Renaissance artwork, you know, think of, uh, think of The Last Judgment uh, by Michelangelo that we just looked at. Here is Jesus, and with these people dressed in every regular day peasant clothes, or almost looks like beggars if you notice the rip in St. Thomas's um, shirt. And there he is actually putting his finger into the side of Jesus, as, as described in the Bible. However, not the glory that you think of in the resurrected Christ, more of this kind of Baroque, dark um, subject matter. The next artist I want to talk about is Artemisia Gentileschi. She is the first artist I get to talk about in 200 years, which really excites me. She was a very talented artist. She highly respected Caravaggio. In fact, she attended church where two of his paintings were prominently displayed, and Caravaggio and her father were close friends and allies, as her father was a painter as well. The painting on the right, or the, excuse me, the painting on the left is the beheading of Saint, the beheading of John the Baptist, who you may know was uh, beheaded by the request of a girl to the king. And the painting on the right is from an, old, an apocryphal story of um, um, Judith and Holofernes. Judith was a Jewish woman. Uh, Holofernes was a king of Syria who was uh, extremely interested in uh, ridding the world of Jews, as, which is, has been a theme throughout history. However, uh, Judith was able to seduce Holofernes and save her people. Another interesting, very interesting note about the painting of Judith and Holofernes. In that painting, the Judith is a self-portrait of Artemisia Gentileschi. And Holofernes, as he's gasping for his last breath, is a portrait of another artist who had assaulted Artemisia Gentileschi. So I guess she gets to historically get him back. The final Baroque artist we are going to look at is another one of my all-time favorite. His name is Bernini. Bernini sculpted in marble. That's marble. Look at those hands sinking into that flesh in the Persephone right there. That is marble. Look at how dynamic and elegant um, the Apollo and Daphne are. And if you look at those leaves, I've always heard that those leaves are translucent or they, you can see light through them. Of course, the painting, or excuse me, the marble sculptor on the left depicts uh, Persephone and Hades, Persephone being the goddess of spring, Hades being the brother of Zeus, um, the god of the underworld. Hades came to find himself a wife, took Persephone against her will, and that's exactly what this moment's depicting. Of course, Demet Demeter, Persephone's mom gets so bent out of shape, she almost starves the entire world to death, and uh, Zeus makes Hades compromise. So now Persephone is um, with her mom half the year, that would be in the spring and the summer, and with her husband half the year, of course, that would be in the fall and the winter. The sculptor, the sculptor on the right is of Apollo and Daphne. Apollo, the god of music. Daphne it was a wood nymph. Um, the god of uh, the god of mischief, Eros, or better known as Cupid, pierced Apollo with a gold arrow so he could do nothing but pursue his love for Daphne no matter what, no matter how. He also pierced Daphne with a lead arrow, which completely turned her off to Apollo's advances. And prior to this, Daphne had, plowed, had pledged to be chased anyway. So right at the moment that Apollo is about to take on Daphne and um, express his love, Daphne's father turns her into a laurel tree. And from that time on, Apollo was always shown with laurel in his hair, laurel with his leer, and laurel became a symbol for uh, the, uh, the Caesar in Rome. 
This is St. Teresa in ecstasy. This is depicting the moment that St. Teresa accepted the Holy Spirit into her heart and how it took her breath away. I just want you to look at this long, soft, flowing cloth and realize that's marble. That's a rock. That is a rock he carved that out of. I also included a video on uh, the in your folder about the Baldacino in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. A picture just couldn't do it justice. So if you want to watch the smart history video about the Baldacino, Baldacino I highly recommend it. Thank you for your time and attention.